So the chemical is released into the bloodstream and it travels long distances to a target cell and then at a cause response. So a couple of things you see in each of these pictures is that there's a signal involved, right? Some kind of chemical. You see that each of these cells have receptor proteins on their surface. So you'd have to have a receptor that matches that chemical and they're very much like an enzyme with the lock and key conformational fit um, or induced fit. So those are two components that you need for any cell signaling. Okay, I kind of spent a lot of time on that one. So here's a couple of examples of what cells um, might use for cell signaling to get the signal from one place to the other. So, um, so this one is called a plasmodesmata. And I have a, a slide that's just on this too, because I combined a couple different um, PowerPoints. But the plasmodesmata, these are in plant cells. So um, it's a it's a tube that allows um, the two, like chemicals can just move from one to the next cell. And then down here, similar to that, so they would be analogous, animals have what are called gap junctions. So you can see the tunnel a little bit better in this picture, I guess. The gap junction, so these chemicals can move directly into the next cell. So that would allow this cell to talk to this cell, okay? And this is um, common in like the heart muscle itself has gap junctions. So when one cell gets a signal, every single cell doesn't have to get that signal to like beat, but that signal is sent through that tube to all of the cells. So they all beat in um, synchrony. And then antigen presentation has to do with, um, I have another slide that's going to be have a picture of that one. But antigens are like foreign proteins on the surface of cells. So our bodies read these and decide whether something belongs in us or not. So like you have antigens on your cells, but they don't elicit a, a response. So they're considered self antigens. But like if you were allergic to peanuts, peanuts have protein surface or proteins on their surface that your antibodies would read if you were allergic and identify it as a non-self antigen and it would elicit an immune response. So antigen presentation, like a cell would eat, whatever the cell eats, it displays on its surface. So then another cell would bind to that and say, oh, that doesn't belong here, let's respond. We said that there's, um, there's the signal and then there's the, um, these are different types of signals. So it could be a glycoprotein, a glycolipid. No, these are the receptors. <laughs> so on the surface of the cell, there's a glycoprotein. Um, so glyco, remember, is sugars, and we normally think of those as those antennas, right? And they might be attached to a protein or a lipid. So that's a way of identifying the cell. So that's cell-to-cell -cell recognition, identifying um, what it is. Then local regulators, so here's our paracrine, remember, around. So auto or paracrine signaling would be local. And um, like nerve cells use synapses, and I showed you that yesterday or last week. Um, the synapses um, are spaces. So not a tube like the gap, but spaces. So neurotransmitters can diffuse across that gap. Like here, you can see there's a gap you could consider that one. Um, so that allows nerve cells to talk to other cells. So this would only be true, true with nerve cells. And so those only go short distances and that's where you need the endocrine for the long distance. So with short distance, they have to be in direct contact with one another. Um, this is an example of that gap junction. Um, so we saw that one really already. The kind of things that might move through a gap junction, ions, sugars, amino acids, like things that are too big to diffuse, right? Or ions can't diffuse because they're charged. Um, this is your plasmodesmata. So this is just showing a bunch of um, plant cells. So the same kind of things would move through there. Um, plant cells actually make hormones as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so the long distance ones, the endocrine. Um, so again, these are going to deal with hormones. And I kind of mentioned, um, the hormones are moving through the circulatory system, so they move through the bloodstream to a target cell. 
nervous system can also go long distance, but it's um, like one cell to another cell to another cell to another cell. So the chemical doesn't go a long distance, um, but the transmission does. And then um, with plants, so we move our hormones through the bloodstream. They move their hormones through the xylem. Do you remember we talked about the xylem and phloem? Phloem is for food, like glucose. Xylem is for water. And like our blood is mostly water, right? And the hormones travel in the bloodstream. So that could help you remember that the hormones travel through the xylem, which is the water component. Sometimes they're released into the air, so that would be more maybe like paracrine because it's around. And that's how like all your, like your apples are all ripening at the same time because they release the chemical surrounding them. One of the things we have to be able to do is to describe the components of a signal transduction pathway. So transduction is like a relay system. So you can think of it that way. So there's really three components, the signal, the receptor protein, and the cellular response. So the signal here are signals, right? So if they are small and non-polar, they can just travel through the membrane themselves. So lipids can travel through the membranes. Um, and then they would bind with a receptor protein inside of the cell. If they are large or they're polar molecules, they would have to bind with a receptor protein on the surface. They can't go through the membrane. So there's usually going to be a secondary messenger involved when the receptor protein is on the surface. So then it's a relay system. The secondary messenger um, like sends the signal on then inside the cell for whatever the response is going to be. So those are the three parts. Um, the signal, so refer to these that bind and cause response, you refer to those as ligands. And I talked about how the protein would have to bind a receptor protein and a lipid would be able to travel through and bind inside the cell. This could also be a polar molecule, like an ion that causes an ion channel to open, for example. And we talked about that one last week with um, sodium channels and acetylcholine. So I left that one there if you wanted to, I left blanks in that picture if you wanted to go back and um, try to label them. So now I'm gonna go into each one of those pieces by themselves. So I'll talk about um, the receptor, the signal, um, well, the signal, the receptor, and then the, or the transduction, however you wanna call it, and the response. So um, in this case, I have a receptor protein in my signal molecule, which we always wanna to refer to as, an, in, as um, a ligand. So like epinephrine, epinephrine has to bind a ligand um, to be able to go in, to be able to cause response inside the cell. And remember epinephrine is also called adrenaline. So you refer, refer to one of those two. So these two um, act just like the um, enzymes, lack and key method. Um, so a certain signal will fit a certain receptor protein. And remember, one of the things you're gonna to have to answer is like, if there is a change to the system, how would that affect the system? So you could affect the shape of this protein, for example, right? Um, and then if this protein changes shape, it wouldn't be able to bind that receptor and therefore nothing after that would happen. Um, you could affect this by putting in a competitor a com that looks like the original signal. So if that binds the receptor, nothing else will happen, right? So think about how you could affect the, um, the system, and that's gonna be one of the things you're gonna need to do on that test. Not necessarily with this process, but you'll get the hang of it. And I think this process is a good one to work with. Um, okay, so the receptor may also be inside of the cytoplasm. So we talked about it might bind here and it might bind inside. Okay, so then um, these are showing you different examples of ligands, or this is a ligand, and it's showing you how it causes conformational change, right? So this is a gated channel and it's closed. When the ligand binds, it opens. So this is how acetylcholine works. 
And then this is a sodium channel. So when acetylcholine binds that receptor, it opens the channel and then sodium can come in. Um, so channel receptors are gonna be really important in the nervous system, for example. And then that causes a response inside the cell. Last week I talked about the depolarization, which would be the effect of that sodium rushing in. Okay. Um, so the second step is the transduction, and this is the relay into the cell. So we have the receptor protein, and then it's going to cause, um, this could be a secondary messenger, then another protein creates an effect, and it continues passing it on through the pathway until it gets to its end result. Usually that's gene regulation. So quite often this ultimately is creating protein synthesis. It may also cause apoptosis. It may um, cause a secretion from the cell, as would be the case um, with an endocrine gland. So we're transmitting this signal into a form inside of the cell that could produce a response. So this is what that looks like. The transduction can be quite complicated, but not always. Um, so often it involves this protein, this kinase phosphorylation cascade. So first of all, remember kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate other molecules. And when they phosphorylate them, it causes them to become active. So it turns them on, so to speak. So this is showing you the signal of the receptor. And then this is your first kinase, which causes ki like phosphorylation, which converts this protein into this active form, which then phosphorylates another molecule that turns it into its active form. So it keeps just amplifying because this can um, like affect several of these actually proteins. Um, so it keeps passing it along. It's kind of like passing the baton until finally you get to the end result, the cellular response, whether that's sending a vacuole or, you know, to the surface, a vesicle to release a hormone, or if it's turning on cell destruction or it's turning on cell um, regular, um, you know, protein synthesis. So a lot of times a secondary messenger is involved. So you refer to this as a G-coupled protein. They like to use that G-coupled protein. G stands for guanine triphosphate, which is like adenine triphosphate, ATP, only using guanine instead of adenine. Um, so, so when the ligand binds the G-coupled protein, it um, turns on the G protein which then is going to signal a cascade that starts with phosphorylating CAMP, which is cyclic AMP. So this phosphate gets moved to the cyclic AMP. So it's constantly going between forms of AMP, ATP, cycling. So then that transfers its phosphate to the protein kinase, which from there we talked about, goes through a cascade of phosphorylations to ultimately cause response. The third one is the response. So signal, reception, transduction, response. And the response might be um, breaking something down. It might be activation of a gene and it might be um, triggering apoptosis. And like I said, the majority of them have to do with protein synthesis. So they're either activating or inactivating, um, inhibiting in that sense, protein synthesis. So a single signal can cause several responses and several signals can cause the same response. So it can get tricky there. But here, this is just a simplistic picture of the ligand, the receptor, the cascade, which is the transduction. And then I said most of them have to do with protein synthesis. So this is showing you how it's going to then work with, like activate the transcription factors. And remember that helps the polymerase bind. And then, um, and then you can create 
mRNA, process it, and then make proteins. So this is then summing that all up, okay? So the ligand, this guy here, is the signal molecule. It might be a protein hormone, a lipid pro hormone. It might be an ion. It might be a neurotransmitter. The receptor protein is either bound to the membrane or it's inside the membrane. And then it sends the signal either to a G-coupled protein, a G protein, or to a cascade of kinases. Ultimately, it gets to the inside of the cell where it causes its response. So you should be able to describe the pathway, the components, and if you think about the three parts, you could describe it that way. And then you should also be able to describe the role. So what's the purpose of the ligand? What's the purpose of the receptor protein? What's the purpose of the cascade? So this is the quorum sensing. So um, Bonnie Bassler refers to it as a way for the bacteria to take a vote. So when there's enough of them, they can cause a response. Um, so this is, you see low density bacteria, not a lot of signals, so there's no response. And then notice a lot more is happening in here. Um, so once they have a high concentration of that signal molecule, it turns on the regulation of the gene that fluoresces, like our glowing proteins that we did. This one here, this is the antigen presentation that I didn't have a picture of before. So um, APC stands for antigen presenting cell. Quite often, it is going to be like a phagocytic white blood cell. So this is a macrophage, it eats up bacteria that is in the bloodstream, and then it presents pieces of that bacteria on its surface. It will bind with a B cell. This is in the humoral immunity video. It'll bind with a B cell, which then causes the B cell to proliferate, make more copies of it, and ultimately cause a response. Um, this is another example only with the T cell. So this is in the cell mediated video. And then this would be one of your tissue cells. So your tissues, if they're infected, they will present components of the infection on their surface. The uh, T cell, helper T cells would bind that protein that's on the surface, read it as being self or non-self, and then call in the army um, and elicit the immune response. Okay, so that would be antigen presentation. So that would be cell to cell communication. Um, so this says, describe the role of the environment in eliciting a cellular response. So this example showed you how the density of the signal molecule could turn on a gene. This is showing you how the presence of an antigen would cause a cellular response. It may also initiate the signal transduction, which we've already talked about. It may also, like bacteria, remember if glucose is present um, outside, we're going to turn on a gene to break down glucose. If we have plenty of tryptophan, we're not going to make any more tryptophan. We're going to inhibit that gene, right? So this would be gene regulation. And then quorum sensing is what we just talked about. So the different cellular responses. So this is the typical, right, generic. This is the generic. We already looked at that. Some things that might happen, it might change the cell's function, um, cause replication or proliferation. So that B cell, for example, um, when it binds that antigen presenting cell, it's gonna start making more B cells because B cells make our antibodies. Um, the plasma cell of the B cell makes the antibodies. I've already talked about those. Development, so like changing forms um, throughout our, our like fetal development, for example. Um, uh, this Remember we talked about um, alternate slicing. So like if a certain protein was present in the environment, a certain gene was turned on. So that would be similar to what's happening during development. This is where I was talking about this same signal. These are two different cells. And in one case, this one signal causes only one response. In this case, that signal can cause more than one response. And it's not like you would have to memorize any of those responses, just recognize that not only is it specific, there's also a bit of variability here. And then on this one, I have two different signals binding two different receptors 
they cause the same response. And in here, a different receptor finding the same signal causes a different response. So this reminded me a lot of our alternative splicing worksheet that we did where different proteins in the surface. Um, so every cell is different, right? And we don't want all of the genes being turned on in every single one of our cells. So this would be a good example of cell re like gene regulation. Um, so changing any one of these, a mutation in any one of these will cause a change in the whole transformation or the transduction, right? So if the signal um, was in high concentration or low concentration, or there was a competitive signal, if there was a mutation in the receptor protein, if there was a mutation in any one of these or a competitor in any one of these, wherever the new piece to the system is, everything after that will not happen. So you want to be able to make changes to the system and identify the responses. So this is that changing the structure, it'll alter the response. Um, so a mutation in any domain, and that's referring to like the exterior domain or the interior domain. So that would have to do with your hydrophilic and hydrophobic components of the protein, right? Any mutation will change its shape and shape determines its function. So, so if these receptors were changed or these transport molecules were changed, it would not be able to send the signal. Um, so any chemical which interacts with any component of the pathway may activate it or may inhibit it. And if it's supposed to be, um, like if this is supposed to activate something and there's a mutation here, you're not gonna activate it, nothing's gonna happen. If it's supposed to be an inhibitor and there's a change in the inhibitor, it will no longer inhibit, which means the response will continue. So those are things to think about when you're changing the system. Um, I'm moving into nervous, more endocrine. Are you guys good so far? I'm leaving signal transduction. Okay, so these are positive and negative feedbacks. So we talked about negative feedbacks with that tryptophan regulation. So that's a good example. Um, a negative feedback, the response causes the stimulus to cease. So it, it's more like a teeter-totter. It causes an opposite response. Um, a positive feedback causes the stimulus to continue. It's more like an amplifier. So it's making changes in the same direction. And you need these for homeostasis, right? Especially the negative feedback. If homeostasis is maintaining a stable state and my stable state is here, if it gets a little high, I need to bring it down. If it gets a little low, I need to bring it up, right? So that's going to be maintaining the homeostasis. Here's a specific example. Well, no, this is a generic example, but these are the components. And these are kind of similar to a reflex arc. So you have a stimulus, a receptor, a control center. So your stimulus, something's high or something's low. That's the variability. The receptor receptor protein or it could be a sensory receptor and then the control center if it's nervous system that's the brain deciding what to do about it if it's an endocrine system it's the cell's nucleus making things happen right um, the effector so if this is a nervous system it's a gland or organ or muscle um, if this is the, the endocrine system, that effector is probably your DNA, right? You're going to turn on a certain gene. The response is what we do about it. You created a protein. You didn't create a protein. Um, or if it's the nervous system, you ran for your life or you close your eyes to keep something from entering your eyeballs, whatever. Okay, so this is showing you um, the, the changes in the opposite direction if it's negative and in the pot, same direction if it's positive. So a couple um, specific examples. So this is a negative feedback, and this is actually the same feedback loop, two different graphics. So if you were to encounter either one, or maybe one speaks more to you than the other, this is showing you the um, teeter-totter. This is just if it's too high or if it's too low. So this is stable, and we wanna keep it at that level. 
So they like to use um, illustrative examples or illustrative examples, however you want to say it, um, in AP. And it's not that you need to have this thing necessarily memorized, but if you understand how the regulation of blood glucose works, you would understand how any endocrine system works, how any negative feedback works, how any hormone would work. So um, with this one, we're regulating blood glucose levels. There's a certain level we want to have. This is going high, right? So I'm increasing it. So the pancreas is going to release insulin. You've heard of insulin. So insulin then moves through the bloodstream to the liver, which causes the break or the um, storage of glycogen. So glucose connected together in its stored form, the polysaccharide glycogen. So if there's too much sugar in the bloodstream, take it out of the bloodstream and store it in a complicated form. Now, if our levels are too low, we need to get it back out of the liver, right? So now the pancreas is gonna release a different hormone. It's gonna release glucagon. Glucagon causes the breakdown of glycogen and releases glucose into the bloodstream, bringing your blood sugar levels back up. Positive feedbacks, pretty easy in that, like for humans, they're only happening in our, like related to childbirth, pregnancy, and lactation, um, and also with blood clotting. With plants, they're involved with ripening because you want to keep going until a final result. So it causes additional changes um, in the same direction. So like the baby pushing on the um, cervix causes it to stretch, which causes the release of oxytocin. Oxytocin causes contractions of the um, uterus, which causes the baby to further push on the cervix, which causes more release of oxytocin, which causes more contraction. So the positive feedback continues the response until like a goal has been achieved, ripening or the child is born. Okay, what do you think about this one? Here you have blood break, in the wall of the vessel, releases blood, releases these chemicals that attract more chemicals that release more, or like these are platelets that release chemicals which attract more platelets, which release more chemicals which release or attract more platelets. Is this positive or negative? Yes, it's positive. Okay. What about this one? Is this one positive or negative? So um, temperatures, so we're hot. And we then cause our vessels to dilate, putting our blood closer to the surface, which causes evaporation. Water comes out of our blood through our skin, evaporates, and the evaporation is a cooling sensation. Then I'm no longer hot. Is that positive or negative? I turned your pictures off so I could just see my screen. Good job. Okay, unit four, just think of it. This all is about like communication. So then the cell cycle is regulated, right? There has to be communication from that. You do not have to describe this, the stages of mitosis, but you should be able to describe the events that occur in the cell cycle. So with that, let's just refer to mitosis as one big chunk, right? So G1 is our growth, S synthesis, making more DNA, G2, making proteins and things needed for mitosis. Mitosis moves chromosomes around, the cell splits in half, and then cytokinesis, you end up with two cells identical to the first. So with that, remember mitosis couldn't keep the numbers the same if you didn't have all of this interphase, right? If you didn't have synthesis. So the synthesis makes more. So we wanna be able to explain how mitosis results in the transmission of chromosomes. So really just talk about moving the chromosomes, splitting the cell in half, and that would work for that. You don't have to describe like prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Remember some cells get arrested in G0, like the liver and the muscle cells, um, nervous cells, where they are not gonna continue um, the cell cycle. Now, like liver cells will be called back into the cell cycle when it's 
when they're needed um, under a stressful situation, we need to make more of them. Um, this could also be arrested and then um, remember apopt apoptosis would correct, um, it would get rid of cells that are damaged or infected. And then the checkpoints, remember cyclin and CDKs. Cyclin dependent kinases, kinases we just talked about phosphorylate, phosphorylation turns, um, it'll either put something in its active form or inactive form, but for the most part, we talk about the active form. So at each of these, um, there's a checkpoint and make sure that the cell's big enough to support two cells, right? It makes sure that all the DNA has been co copied. It makes sure that the sisters are all paired on the metaphase plate. So at any point, if these are not, like if everything's not just right, the cell will go through apoptosis. If it's not checking itself, that's when we get cancer, right? So I think that's what this graphic is at the bottom. This cell, um, this is how it should go, but if your clock gets all wacky, simplistic version, you get an overgrowth because we're ignoring those cyclin dependent kinases. This is another place where you could cause a disruption to a system, right? So if these cyclin dependent kinases, if these um, had, a, had a mutation, they're not going to fit together. They're not going to be able to do their job. And then everything after that will go wrong, right? Okay, so that is the end of unit four.